started. Good afternoon, welcome to Xtalk Digital Discourse. My name is Molly Ruggles. Xtalk is a forum to facilitate awareness, understanding, and transference of digital educational innovations at MIT and beyond. If you're not on the Xtalk's mailing list and would like to be kept up to date on future events, uh, my colleague Judy Leonard is going to pass around the list. Please sign up. Um, our next event this fall will be a book release party on Tuesday, December 2nd at 3.30 in the Bush Room. And we will be celebrating Sanjoy Mahajan's new book, The Art of Insight in Science and Engineering. And Sanjoy will talk about the concepts in the book as well as his process publicizing the book, publishing the book, and there will also be MIT titles his book, his previous book, as well as Vijay Kumar's Opening Up Education and other related titles for sale at a discount. Um, please help yourself to snacks today. We also encourage you to extend the discussion on Xtalk's Twitter feed, hashtag MIT Xtalk. Today's session features Elizabeth Cho and George Zayden, who will introduce us to MIT plus K-12 videos and science out loud an outreach web series through which MIT students write and host original educational videos. Elizabeth is program manager for MIT plus K-12 videos. As an undergrad at MIT, she studied biological engineering and worked for a TV production company to develop science show pitches. George is also an MIT alum with a BS in chemistry. He's produced and hosted videos for MIT, the Weather Channel, TED-Ed, National Geographic, and the History Channel. So Elizabeth and George will talk for about 45 to 50 minutes, and there'll be some opportunities to ask questions, but there'll also be opportunities at the end to ask more questions, comments, and so forth. So at this moment, would you please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Elizabeth and George. Thank you very much for coming to today's talk. Um, we're going to open with just a little clip that describes what we do. So as Molly said, uh, we're MIT K-12 videos. We produce Science Out Loud, which is our original web series that's written and hosted by MIT students that George and I produce. Um, George directs the series. Um, and we actually are in the Office of Digital Learning at MIT, but it started about three, four years ago in the School of Engineering. Um, and Dean Waits and the crew there kind of wanted to address this question, which is why isn't there better representation in STEM fields? Um, and the idea was to create this compendium, this library of 
crowdsourced, student-created, um, near-peer videos to get kids excited about STEM. Um, and our backgrounds are not only as scientists and engineers, but um, like Molly said, we've had some experience in production, George, much more than I have. Um, and I have a particular interest in thinking about how informal media, um, subtly or not so subtly, impacts the way we think about STEM and our cultural perceptions of what scientists and, and engineers look like. Um, so today's talk is going to be on sort of the, the power and the possibilities that exist with short form video um, and how we can leverage it to address uh, certain needs in STEM education and the challenges that come with it. Um, so when PBS Kids uh, develops their shows, they think about something called the Trusted Guide, which is someone like Mr. Rogers. It's the host, but more than the host, it's really this role model that embodies everything that they're talking about. People like these guys. Um, and these guys span a, a wide variety of formats, uh, of generations. Um, Bill Nye sort of the quintessential STEM advocate. He's instructional, inspirational, there's longevity. My 12-year-old brother still watches Bill Nye in his classroom. Um, but you'll notice that this picture looks fairly homogenous despite the fact that it's spanning quite a, a variety of um, formats. And I went to this conference at WGBH a few weeks ago and there was this panel of hosts uh, who host science shows. And M. Sanjan was there and he, he was part of the Emmy-winning series um, on climate change. And he's hosting an upcoming PBS special, and he talked about how they took this huge risk with him being like a minority, um, and how great it was. And I asked him, I was like, well, I can't really think of a single female host of a nonfiction scripted series. Why do you think that is? And he goes, well, it's too much of a risk. And this was after he had spent all this time talking about how great it was that networks took a risk on him. <laughs> <laughs> um, and not to slight him, I think he's a great host, and like, He's awesome on, on, on Years of Living Dangerously. But it, you can't help but wonder how that sort of not so subtly affects kids who are watching these shows when they don't see a single person. I never saw a single person that I related to on screen. Um, and it kind of breeds this idea that the door, the door to STEM is maybe only open to certain people, which is obviously very problematic. Um, and then on top of that, our current educational model hasn't been relevant since the Industrial Revolution. Um, we're kind of in these classroom factory settings, and it's very hard for teachers to breed this lifelong love of learning in this format. Um, and then most importantly, and I, I do want to emphasize this fact, we're not about creating scientists. It's okay if a kid watches one of our videos and is like, you know what, engineering is awesome, but I'm going to go be an artist. Um, we're really about building STEM literacy because whether or not you're a scientist, these sorts of things affect your everyday life. Um, and it's not a scary thing and it's not you know, an, a non-understandable thing, but it's something that we do want to promote and feel a sense of civic responsibility to do so. Um, and YouTube plays a very interesting role in all of this. So these are all shows that um, have over a million subscribers each. Um, and George has made a couple TED Ed videos that are pretty awesome. You should check them out. <laughs> um, but it's, it's an interesting approach to solving the, the previous three problems that I had outlined um, because it's theoretically open to anyone. Anyone can upload, anyone can watch. So technically, anyone can be inspired by these videos. Um, and the people who watch them aren't kids in a classroom. They're, they're kids like my brother, and then there are people like my parents who will watch SciShow. Um, people who are scientists, people who aren't, and they're watching them because they just want to know stuff. They want to know what Ebola is. They want to know what would happen if everyone on Earth would jump at the same time. And they're achieving <laughs> all of these things that we're saying are huge problems that somehow our uh, traditional education system aren't, aren't achieving. Um, and I think they achieve them for a couple reasons. Now, most of them take this format of asking why, what, and how. Why is the sky blue? Um, how does a vaccine work? And this lends itself to being quite contextual. It's very different from how do I solve a differential equation. Um, and they're also very shareable. And I think the very act of sharing these videos um, is very conducive to retrieval learning. Kids are talking about videos multiple times. You'll watch them multiple times. They're super searchable. And then when you finish watching a video, there are suggested videos. So there's this inherent um, 
sort of vetting process, you can associate value or if something's worth your time based on its virality and view count. Um, there's a trusted guide. Uh, all those shows have awesome branding, even if there's not a face on screen. And then there's this sense of community. There's no invisible college. Anyone can comment. Um, the Hank, Hank Green and his brother, who do SciShow and Crash Course, they interact with their community constantly. Um, Vsauce decides how to make their shows based on what people ask him to make in the comments. Um, so it's sort of reaching the, the holy grail of ed tech, because all these people are engaging. Um, it's, it's happening exactly the way we want it to happen. Um, and not just with those shows, but with more formal YouTube shows. Um, these are more instructional based. I would say these are explainer videos, so people are going to them when they're like, I don't know how to solve for molar mass. They go to Tyler DeWitt's videos. Um, it's a different kind of service, but just as valuable because they're taught by these very um, gifted teachers, and it's helping students achieve mastery and, and giving them confidence in learning. Um, but despite all of this, the picture actually looks fairly similar and fairly homogenous to all the shows that I was talking about earlier. Um, and then we have a place like MIT where the picture is very different. So this is the cast of season one of Science Out Loud. Um, and they all come from different backgrounds. They have different interests. And I think it's probably one of our greatest value propositions here, just the student body. Um, and we're at MIT where it's a place where you can take risks and you have a, a wide range of people. Um, there are research facilities that places like SciShow could never access. You know, they could do a video on nuclear reactors. We actually have students here who work at real nuclear reactors and could film there. Um, and then we have ways of disseminating them that are, are very unique. Um, so this all sounds great. We have these great ingredients, right? We have a great hosting body. We have the techno technological tools to deliver this content. Um, theoretically, we could just mix it all together and have a great product, which is essentially what um, the pilot round of K-12 videos did. Um, it was a big experiment to see what would happen if you gave a student here a thousand bucks to make a video. Um, and there were 114 videos that came out of that big experiment. Um, and I'll quickly share some stats because I think they're very interesting. When students are sort of left to their own devices and allowed to make whatever they want, an overwhelming majority of them make a physics video. And of the electronics video, six out of the seven are about circuits. Um, most of the people who make them are grad students. And of the grad students, a fifth of the videos were made by the same group of grad students. Half of them are explainer videos. Half of them are about, like, how do you solve for buoyancy? How do you solve for the gravitational force? Um, Half of them have equations on screen. Less than half of them feature a student on screen. Um, of the 114, can anyone guess how many actually highlight any sort of resource that a high school student would have access to? So this would be anything beyond a high school classroom. And this is with maybe 90% of our undergrads working in a, a research lab here. No guesses? Do you know what's exactly the question? If, if a student here has access to anything at MIT, how many of them actually used a resource that a, a typical high school student wouldn't have? Wouldn't have. Right. And there were 114 videos. 40? 40. Only 14. Um, and of the 114 videos, there were some that were just straight up Khan Academy or Viheart videos, which is where you uh, write on a tablet or you write on a chalkboard, or you write on a notebook, and you just explain an equation. There were more of those videos than ones that highlighted labs here. And there were only 30 that actually had a demo, and all of those demos were things that kids can do at home. So I think that there is value with what came out of the experimentation, and there are some really awesome videos that came out of it. Um, but it didn't quite reach the, the idea of the innovative library that they had in mind, or I think we would have had in mind. Um, and George is going to talk a little bit about maybe why that is, because making videos is really hard. <laughs> so um, I will let George take it from here. OK. Um, <clears throat> so by the way, uh, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me uh, at any point and yell it out. Um, 
So we have a motto for K-12 videos or for Science Out Loud, and that motto is not something that we started with. It happened to us on a Thursday. This is the first Thursday of our product, first week of production on season one. Let me just take you through that day. This is 7.28 AM. We were shooting a video about the science of bouncing, the physics of bouncy balls. And that is a John McEnroe impression, uh, just <laughs> FYI. Um, uh, by, three, by, by noon, that video was done. We had another video to shoot that same day, which was about the uh, physics of engines. At 12.06 PM, we discovered that the script had to be completely rewritten. So we rewrote it over lunch. We rewrote it in the car on the way to the airport, uh, which is where our hosts, who are both licensed pilots, um, uh, were taking us. By 3 p.m. we had shot that, that particular scene. 4.43 p.m. the sun sets and we leave the airport. 5.53 p.m. we need to do a scene about how a car engine is different than an airplane engine, or similar in this particular case. Uh, 6.31 p.m. we snuck into an unnamed hardware store to film a um, scene about how a lawnmower engine is different than a plane engine, is different than a car engine. Uh, honestly, I don't really remember this because we're getting late right now. It's 9.50 p.m. Um, then we needed a cutaway of a piston engine, which they were like, oh, you know what? We have a cutaway of a piston engine somewhere in our lab. We don't really know where it is, but we can go look for it if that's helpful. That, that was Abby. And we were like, yeah, that'd be really helpful. Can we go find it? So we did, and we filmed it. And then they were like, you know, we also have a 737 engine if you want to use that. We were like, yes, we definitely want to use that. Um, so we go and we see it, and it's, you can't, it's hard to tell in this picture, but it's covered by glass panels that have like 800 screws in them. Um, and it was kind of against the wall. I mean, it's hundreds of pounds. And at this point, it's, I, I don't know, it's like 10.30 PM, something like that. And Elizabeth and I look at each other. Luke and I look at each other. Abby and I look at each other. And we're all just kind of like, let's do this. So the engine says, do not stick your body parts in the engine. And the first thing we do is stick our body parts in the engine. We disassembled the whole thing. It took us an hour and a half. But we ended up with an incredible scene uh, that I had never understood how a jet engine actually works. Um, and that, that's what came out of this video. So our motto here is like, go big or go home. If you're going to do it, do it. Don't half-ass two things, full-ass one thing. Um, <laughs> So that is kind of how we operate. And now I'll t take you through like the actual production process of what it takes to make, to make a video. So there are three general steps. This is a very circular and unhelpful definition. But here's what actually these steps mean. Um, and we don't have time to go through every single step, but I'll just take you through a few of the things that are important. Um, the middle part, which is production, is wh what you all think of when you think of video making, because it's the most fun part. It's the, you know, where we sit and film everything. But it's actually the tip of the iceberg. The, the part that takes the most effort and energy are the parts before production and the parts after production. Um, but production is the most fun, and it's the place where the lowest hanging fruit is. It's the place where you can make sure that your video doesn't suck. Um, and if you follow like mm, four basic rules or five basic rules, you can pretty much get 80% of the way to a good video. Rule number one, don't put your character's head in the center of the frame. It looks really weird. Uh, you want to put your character higher up in the frame than you would think. Rule number two is? What do all of these awesome compounds have in common? They all come from plants. Rule number two is shoot a lot of B-roll, which is like shoot stuff that isn't just your character talking on screen. Uh, this is a great opportunity to like look at the marvel of plants, and it gives the video some breathing room and some space. Uh, rule number three is? Uh, don't rely on the sun or the most common type of lighting at MIT, which is overhead fluorescence. It makes your characters look really, really bad, and it's super avoidable. Use a light like um, we're using here today. Uh, that, that is uh, a well-lit scene, or it's, it's OK. It's, we could do better, but it's OK. Um, that thing in his eye, that, that, uh, that little gleam in his eye, is the catch light. And that's what gives your character soul. And it's something that's really minor, but um, uh, works well in videos. That's what the lighting for that scene looked like. Chaos. Uh, the last rule is. So the last rule is, or the second to last rule is, sorry, uh, don't rely on camera audio. This is like one of the number one things that, that we see all the time is people don't think about audio. That's, that's audio straight from the camera. And this is what the same scene sounds like with audio on a real microphone. Just like how all the 
DNA in an organism that forms the genome, all of the metabolites form the metabolome. So there's a huge difference, and it's not that much extra effort. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is hosting, and this is, this is one of the really hard things and one of the things that we struggle with a lot on Science Out Loud because our, our students are not professional hosts, but there are things that you can do um, to be more natural on camera. Um, like a lot of things in this process, good hosting is transparent. So I'm going to show you a clip of one of our favorite hosts from season two. These agricultural waste products, or ag waste, would normally be discarded as trash. But we can use them to make charcoal, and poof, your trash becomes a precious resource. And that's how you turn trash into treasure. Less expensive, cleaner burning, more sustainable treasure. It's clear that she loves what she's talking about. She's super excited about it. She's not talking down to the audience. She's not reading. She ha doesn't have it memorized, or it doesn't seem like she has it memorized. It's very natural, and it flows. And that is really hard to do. Um, but it can be done with, with coaching. So that's, those are the basic rules of production. That's the, the easy part. Uh, and that's where you make your video not suck. The part where you make your video really good are the planning and the post-production, so the pre-production and the post-production. Um, and I'm not gonna, again, I'm not going to go through everything, but I want to do two, two big things here. First is the idea. Um, not everything deserves to be a video. Not everything should be a video, and that's OK. Um, you want to ask yourself, why am I making a video about this? Like, could I do the same thing with text and pictures? And if you can, if you can do it more effectively or just as effectively, then don't waste your time. It's, you know, video is harder to do really well than um, uh, text and images. So if you can do text and images, do text and images. Um, what visuals will I show? That's kind of related to the first question. Who would watch this? That's really important. If you're making a video and your audience, you can think of like one person, then you need to re, you know, think about changing your idea or, or doing a video for a broader audience. Um, this is something that Elizabeth was talking about. What is going to make your video shareable? What's, what's going to make it viral? What's going to make it spread? Is there something, and this is something that MIT has so much of. Like, there is so much here that most people don't know. And when they, they hear it, they'd be like, oh my god, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. Um, so it, and that requires like stepping out of the MIT ecosystem for five minutes and thinking about what all the stuff that we have here that most people don't have access to um, and figuring out how to maybe put that at the beginning of the video to hook your audience. Um, and then the question that we ask ourselves all the time when we're shooting, and it's not just what the, what's the point of this video, it's like what's the point of this scene, what's the point of this line, what's the point of shooting it, you know, why are we even using a 737 engine, what's the point? And if you can't answer that question clearly and cogently and effectively, then do it somewhere else. Um, okay. The next thing is scripting, and the, the big rule here is write it like you would say it, because eventually you will say it. Um, this is a paragraph from Science, the, the magazine Science, or the, the journal Science. Uh, and this is explaining how there are more um, microbial cells in your gut than there are human cells in your entire body. That's, let's see, six lines. This is how we said it in the video. Um, and you know, if you, th this is the kind of thing that actually needs no training. Um, you're all trained to write like scientists, technicians. Um, where uh, you take like four or five more words than you know more words than you than you really need, um, and yes, you lose precision. That's true. I grant you. Um, but in a video, it's going to be like three, four minutes. That's okay. The point is not to accurately convey every tiny last detail. The point is to inspire and ignite. Um, then, okay, so that was pre-production. Then we'll go to post-production, which is what happens after the fact. And this is this is the part that. Or this is one of the other parts that really gets ignored a lot. Um, the first thing is editing. So who here has seen The Graduate? OK, good. So this is the last scene of The Graduate. Uh, Dustin Hoffman is, uh, has, is about to elope with uh, this woman who is about to be married to someone else. Um, and this is, the, this is the scene how it was scripted. That's it, happily ever after. Except this is the scene how it was shot.
<laughs> Still happy. But then they're like, oh shit, what do we do now? What do we just do? So that was unplanned. That just happened on the day of shooting and the editor decided to keep it in. And you can see the, the, the next 20 years in that 20 seconds of them looking at each other, right? So it ch completely changes the tenor of the scene and of the movie. And that is true for any video. The, the edit is where you really see the thing like breathe and take, take shape and take life. Um, Another thing about editing is that it's not just one person sitting in a room who takes the project and then you see it late, you know, a month later magically and it's done. Um, it's just as collaborative as the rest of the process. So the, this is a Google Doc with comments that Elizabeth and I wrote to our editor who's, uh, who's out in California. Um, and this is, this is the round one of comments. That's round two. That's round three, four, five, six. And then we had the final video. So every video, I mean, six is typical. Like everything will go through six iterations. Um, and uh, so plan to spend time on that. And that is important. Music, I mean, you saw in The Graduate what music can do for a scene. It's the same thing in science videos. You can set the, the, mo the mood, set the tone, and we do that. Um, uh, we, bu we actually budget for music. So good music costs money, and we, we build that into our, into our budget. Um, animations are cool. Uh, and our animator is Elizabeth, because uh, it turns out she can draw really well. Uh, these are drawn by her. Um, and the point of this scene, this is the same, the same thing we were talking about earlier about how there's 100 trillion um, microbes in your gut, which is 10 times the number of human cells. And the natural question that arises is, well, if there are so many more you know, microbial cells than human cells, how come I'm not just a giant bacterium oozing everywhere? Um, and the answer is because bacteria are smaller than human cells which is not something we ever say in the video. We don't say it out loud. But just having the animation overlaid shows you that with, visually without having to say it. Um, and that's, that's how we tend to use animation as, a, as either an accent or as uh, an explainer for when we, we don't want to actually say something out loud. Um, and that's it. That's the process. Oh, there is one more thing. You have, after you do this for a round of videos, you have to do it all again. Because invariably, there's something you forgot or didn't shoot the right way, or uh, you know, the sound was messed up, or something happens in the process that you have to go back and reshoot. And if you build that in, um, it's a lot less heartbreaking. Um, actually, the whole process is iterative. Within every step, it's an iteration that you go through several, several revisions, and then the whole thing you iterate over and over again. Season two is a lot better than season one for this reason. Um, it takes about 100 person hours to make one five minute video with all these steps. Uh, and, and that is, again, because it's such an iterative process and because we're kind of perfectionists. But we all are at MIT. So, um, two or one or two last things I want to end on. Every, every decision matters, every aesthetic decision in a video matters uh, because it will show up in your final video. Um, and, and that's not enough. I mean, knowing that isn't enough. You have to really understand why you're making the decision. So you know, we're not going to shoot in front of a jet engine just because it's cool. We're going to shoot in front of a jet engine because actually spinning the blades of the engine helps someone understand how that engine works. Um, so it's more than just, you know, let's find a cool background or whatever. It's, it's really how will what I'm seeing on screen enhance my understanding of the science that's being discussed. And the last thing is. Uh, Someone once said this, and I tried to find who it was, but I don't know. But the quote is, it's not what's in the camera that matters. It's not the technical aspect of the camera that matters. It's what's in front of it and what's behind it that makes the difference. And that is absolutely true for these videos. Uh, go big or go home. Thanks, Elizabeth. Wasn't it Fellini? Huh? Wasn't it Fellini? I think it was Fellini. All right. So. All of the original videos that were made in the pilot round were built on this idea of crowdsourcing, which is super appealing because it's peer-to-peer -peer teaching. Uh, it's 
it's sustainable, it doesn't cost very much money. Um, but the problem with crowdsourcing is, as George was saying, it takes a lot of work to do this. So it only really works when it's closely tied to deliberate practice. And by deliberate practice, I mean it's not how many times you practice that matters, it's how you practice video making, thinking about education, thinking about um, meaningful learning experiences that matter. And in the pilot rounds, it was really a cognitive approach to this, meaning that students got a camera set, they got a thousand bucks, they went off, they tinkered with the video, they taught themselves how to make it, and it was a really meaningful experience, um, and they iterated, um, and even within the, the group of the grad students that made like a fifth of the total videos that were made, you can see their progress as they go along, and, and that's a really exciting thing. Um, and I, I think it's also appealing because it, it's what we think of when we think of mind and hand. We think of people sitting in miters, which is the student shop um, that, that has like machines and people go and they tinker and they, they figure out how to uh, solder things together. Um, but it's, it's limited because there's only so much that you can achieve when you don't know how to do some of the things that George was saying. And George wasn't saying crazy things. I mean, I'm sure all of you were nodding along like, oh, that makes sense. You should plan for reshoots. You should um, go big or go home. You should make deliberate decisions, right? But that's very hard to internalize um, if you don't have someone there showing you exactly how to do it. Um, if you give students an analogous space to tinker with learning or education or video, it's very hard to expect analogous results as you would get from a place like MITRE's because kids are coming here with an already inherent inclination to do well or know stuff about mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. So some of the stuff that comes out of MITRE's is really awesome. It's very hard to expect that out of something like a video project or an education project. Um, and the other thing is there's a little bit more at stake here because these videos are essentially being commissioned by MIT to show to the rest of the world and say, hey, these are educational resources for K through 12 kids. It's no longer a sophomore who's tinkering, trying to build a guitar for himself. It's someone who's making a video that could really impact an eighth grader or a ninth grader. Um, so there's more at stake. And then there's this huge opportunity to learn something really awesome that's a little bit missed if you're trying to figure it out all by yourself. Um, so. Again, this is what happens with the, the sort of cognitive theory approach to deliberate practice. Now, when George and I were shooting um, Science Out Loud, we were in a lab, um, and the student was telling us where we could set up all of our gear, and she was like, you know, you can put your cameras here and your lights here and here. Um, and then she said, we can't film over there, though, because they're doing real work. And um, this was a very, <laughs> we talk about this quite a bit, um, because it wasn't set out of malicious intent. Uh, she wasn't trying to be mean or anything. Um, and I totally understand where she was coming from. I, George understands too. If you're you're opting, if you're working on a research project, you're going to prioritize your space over some random video person, right? But it is so reflective and so well epitomizes this attitude that's persistent in STEM. And I think we can say it because we, we're in that community too. But it's this notion that things like developing quote unquote soft skills, like communicating to people outside of your sphere. Um, knowing how to take the time and effort, because it takes a ton of time and effort, to get people excited about what you're excited about, um, is somehow deemed uh, not real work. It's not qualifying as real work. And I think that's super problematic. And then we ask ourselves as a scientific community, why is the general public not voting on things to support science research? Why, why can't we get people to understand climate change even though we've had 30 years of documentaries and consensus within the scientific community. And it's because it's not considered real work, and it, and it is. Um, so we have this opportunity beyond making videos for kids to get them excited about science. We have this opportunity here at this community to equip people and to teach people, hey, once you leave the institute, people are not going to be as jazzed about gel electrophoresis as you are. And you're going to have to convince them why it's important and how that affects what you do in your everyday life. Um, so we've gone this whole talk without addressing the title of our talk, which is Fostering the Next Bill Nye. Um, and it's a total misnomer. I literally just made it up to get you to come here. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's Bill Nye and you know people, like they have this personal resonation with him. But it's not about fostering the next Bill Nye at all. It's not about creating the next TV personality. It's not about um, 
getting you know students here thinking about how to script a video. Um, it's about equipping the students here to become advocates for their passions and to share their love of learning with other people. Yeah. And it's not at all about making videos either. Um, George and I and a couple other folks were teaching this class during our January term here, which is also called Becoming the Next Bill Nye. Also totally made it up to get <coughs> students to sign up for it. <laughs> but the, the idea is that it's not a video production class, right? It's not about knowing how to turn on a camera, what buttons to push. Um, video is a medium. It's not a technique. It's not an afterthought that you stick on to the end of a lecture. And the qualities that are important to becoming a good host and a good writer and a good video producer, a good video maker, are not things that are unique to video. They're things that every single scientist and engineer should have by the time they leave this place. Um, and it's not an MIT thing either. So if you're learning, if you're focused on learning the techniques, you're missing the point. What's important is developing these lifelong abilities that are way more important than the technical skills. So you have this need to uh, create great content for K through 12 kids, but you also have this um, opportunity to capitalize on this space for building digitally literate, educationally literate students here at MIT. They seem like two really combating, um, competing sort of people to serve, but it's actually possible to do both at the same time with this notion of guided mastery. So going back to deliberate practice, if you leave someone to their own devices to sort of iterate and figure out um, and mess up and learn from their mistakes, there's only so much they can do. But when you have someone, like a real teacher, guiding them and giving them feedback um, and working with the students, George and I work with the students from, from day one, from their pitch. They sit down with me and we talk through what, what video is going to come out of this. Um, it can be a much more meaningful experience for everyone. Um, and it's not, these two are not mutually exclusive people to serve if there's an infrastructure in place. Um, this, this term guided mastery was actually coined in the 60s by Arthur Bandura, who was a psychologist at Stanford. And it described this technique to help people get over their phobia of snakes. Um, and the idea was that you, uh, you have this graduated live modeling. So you see someone interact with a snake, and then you have the patient try to interact with the snake, and the therapist sort of helps them out. And it's just one big fancy paper that describes apprenticeship. Um, which is something that is really inherent and core to the scientific endeavor. Everybody knows that to become a scientist, you have to go to grad school and you have to be a postdoc and you have to work in a lab. Um, I used to do a research project at the Koch Institute for Cancer Research. And when I signed up, it wasn't like they gave me a tour of all the equipment and then said, here, okay, go cure cancer, come back in like four years. Um, my Europe mentor sat with me and taught me how to do all the techniques. I'd, try to design my own experiments, I'd fail, he'd sort of help me see where I went wrong and I'd go through that process again. Um, <coughs> apprenticeship is not as easily seen in the video production process though and I think um, it's for a couple reasons, or for one main reason. Um, in science, you see a paper and you're never like, oh, I could have done that, that looks so easy. Um, you kind of build in this sense of rigor, whereas you watch a movie and you think, oh, I could do that, you know? A 14-year-old went viral on YouTube. Why can't a bunch of MIT students do that too, right? Um, but the purpose of video is to make it look as effortless as possible. So it's harder to see the inherent apprenticeship qualities that exist with the whole production process. Um, so if we st start tying a behavioral approach to this deliberate practice that we tie to crowdsourcing. So not just let students tinker on their own, but actually give them feedback with this mentor that built a relationship with them, then the materials that you get that you start to crowdsource could be a little bit more meaningful, could be a little bit better, um, and then the actual process of creating them could be a much richer learning experience for the students too. Um, Martin Storsdijk from the Oregon State University Center for Lifelong STEM Learning um, he spoke at that conference that I was talking about earlier. He said that a meaningful STEM learning experience, any science, tech, engineering, math, learning experience consists of three qualities, which is relationships, rigor, and relevancy. That a, a kid in a seventh grade biology classroom is going to build a relationship with his teacher. He's going to learn real biology, and it's going to be biology that relates to his everyday life. And that's what we really want our videos to have, too. That viewers can build a relationship with the host that they're seeing, that they're learning legit science. Um, and it's science that has a context. 
Um, and it's not necessarily a context that they see every day, like we did a video on the physics of skydiving, but it's something that they really see in the real world. Um, and it's sort of this meta experience because this is also the, the thing that we want our students here to experience as well. Um, we try really hard to build relationships with the students in our class, that they're really learning production, um, and that they can see that the things they're learning and how to be a good host are things that they're going to take outside of Science Out Loud and outside of MIT. So going back to YouTube, they have this product, and they have achieved community and fandom, which is the thing that I think EdTech struggles with right now, is getting people to not only stay engaged, but to really turn technology into a human experience. <coughs> and YouTube does it because their creators spend an enormous amount of time, which is a commodity that no one at MIT has, um, sitting, combing through comments, um, making videos, making supplementary videos, um, and that's something that we're never ever going to be able to do. We can never ask our students to do that. So the question becomes, how do we simulate that engagement um, with our students here to make it both a meaningful experience for our students and for the viewers? Um, now, Logan Smalley, who uh, directs TED-Ed, talks about video having a beginning, middle, and end that's different than what most people would expect. The beginning being sort of the tweet that you send out saying, hey, I posted this new video. The middle being the video itself, but the end being all of these conversations that start to take place afterwards. The, the door that opens or the, the love of learning that stays throughout middle school and high school. Um, getting people to talk about climate change or about evolution. Um, and that's something that I think is a really unique problem and a unique challenge that our program can really start to figure out how to do. Um, and it's an opportunity that perhaps a more behavioral-based approach can start to address. Now, George talked about how whenever you make a video, you should always ask yourself, why am I doing this? And I think with our program, um, we're constantly asking ourselves, what is our value proposition? Why should we make these videos? There are tons of people out there making educational science videos, and they're doing them a lot better than we are. Um, what do we have to offer? And I think that's a very obvious question to ask, but a very important one, um, because there is so much noise out there. Um, and Jason Oler, who does research on some of this stuff, he talks about how abundance can be negatively um, disruptive. Are we adding something valuable, or are we adding to the noise? So we don't have 114 videos. Um, we have maybe 15. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very conscious decision on our part because we do realize that there are things at stake. Um, and I think that we can really start to think about innovating within the videos themselves. Uh, I think a lot of people think about innovating outside the video or within the medium that sort of conveys the video. But we can also start to think about what is it that's in front of the camera, behind the camera, that's going to make the video a unique experience? So the School of Engineering has just started on the MIT Nano project. I'm sure you guys have seen the construction over there. And this is my uh, attempt at trying to redraw their blueprint. Obviously, it's not to scale. That'd be terrible if they tried to build that. Um, but I think that if we take a similar approach to video and education here, um, it could be a, a unique thing and maybe something that would yield different results. But we have to think about our foundation and building up from it. So instead of thinking about tools um, and what we can do with them, we really think about what's our foundation. And our foundation is people in the production and, and education industry. And we have these mentors and producers who can, who can be part of this behavioral, um, deliberate process to, to cultivate the experience of the students here and the videos that they make. And then we have the students, and I'm not talking about undergrads, I'm talking about anyone who can learn from this process. So this includes faculty, staff, um, anyone at MIT who, who can benefit from this uh, conversation between people in the industry and people in STEM. Um, and then you put the tools on top. You build a program from the people, not from the tools. Uh, so again, What's in front of the camera and what's behind the camera are what matter most. Um, and that's where I think the innovation can take place. It's a tricky 
subject to navigate, though, because it's not a scalable thing. Um, how do you take this experience that I think we've created something really special with the, the eight to ten students that we take on at a time, um, but how do you get that to expand beyond the experience here? And I think it should expand because, like I said, it shouldn't be an MIT thing. Um, and that's, that's an ongoing question. And if you want to ask me afterwards, I, we have a couple things in the works that we'll try to address this. Um, but I think that that's really where the focus should be, not so much on the technology, but on the people who are going to be using the tools to do something really special. Now, I just want to close with um, a quick thing. And maybe this is me getting on my soapbox, and I apologize. <laughs> but when I came to MIT as an undergrad, um, Susan Hockfield was still president. And during the convocation, she talked about how we were all going to go change the world. And we were all going to learn all these things at MIT that you know we were going to do awesome things with. And then when I graduated, President Reif was the new president. And during commencement, he talked about the same stuff. He, he talked about how we were all going to go out into the world and take all the things that MIT gave us and you know go change everything. But I never got any of that in between. Um, I never got that in my classrooms. <laughs> and, and that's OK, right? Like, you don't go into thermodynamics and expect to hear your professor be like, here's the Carnot cycle. Go change the world with it, you know? Um, but I do think that there are ways of integrating some of this into the curriculum, ways of consciously thinking about what your place is um, at MIT and then how that translates to a, a social understanding and a civil understanding of who you are who you're developing as a person, as a scientist, as an engineer. Um, and I do think that there's a responsibility for us to equip our students here to be thinking about that. Um, and hopefully, that'll be sort of the undertone that our, our January class will take. Again, I don't want it to be like a soapbox type of thing, but I, I do think it's important to address. Um, so we have an equal responsibility to preserve the integrity of the videos that we're making, but also the experience we're giving to the students here. And I think we do have this awesome, awesome opportunity to innovate within the video space that maybe not a ton of people are doing, um, but is still an exciting challenge for us. So we are super happy to take questions. Um, and if you would like to email either of us, feel free to do so. But thank you again so much for coming, and we'll hang around for a little bit. about uh, like aesthetic templates. So you yes. brought up the uh, example of a lot of people where with doing the crowdsourcing, um, kind of following like what seemed to be a Khan Academy example. Yeah. And I would guess that's because they were like, oh, how does one make an explanatory video? Right. Khan Academy videos are a template. I will follow that template. Yes. For lack of better ideas. To what extent have you thought of uh, the K-12 videos as being an opportunity to develop an alternative, maybe more interesting or helpful yes. aesthetic template? Or are you letting the content drive it such that it's just hard to settle on a template across the diversity yeah. of videos and subjects? Well, I am glad you asked, because I wanted to talk about that, but then it would have been a two hour presentation. <laughs> um, so first and foremost, we want students here to be talking about what they're excited about. So there's no quota on topic. Um, we cast students, so we keep that in mind as we as we cast a season. Um, the Khan Academy thing is interesting because there was actually a formal partnership with SalCon when the program first started, and um, we're sort of in the works of revisiting that, but it's looking a little different. I think um, <coughs> one of the things that we'd like to do is turn K-12 videos into a digital network so that we have a menu of options, a menu of shows, um, because there's no one style of learning. and. There are people who are going to the instructional videos. The ones that go most viral on our channel are actually just the straightforward explainer ones, and they're getting 100K plus hits. So there's obviously a need for, for some more straightforward videos. Um, so that's in the works to train students to do something aside from just Science Out Loud, which is you know, a completely different sort of production um, format. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to address that you asked about is, you know, students who kind of just like pick a Khan Academy video because they think, oh, this is how I should do it. Um, what we do with Science Out Loud is a lot of the students come in and they have this notion of like what a good host sort of sounds like. 
and you hear them talking and then you turn on the camera and they're a completely different person. Um, and we're like, no, 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 no. Like, we want you to just be you. Um, and they're like, be me? Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> and I think that's, an also, that's also a super interesting opportunity for the class because when we're teaching people how to be hosts, we're not teaching them to be Bill Nye. Um, we're sort of saying, well, why do you change so much when all of a sudden you're asked to talk in a formal setting? You don't actually have to compromise like who you are as an individual. Um, but that's maybe like a more nuanced philosophical thing. I don't know if I answered your question at all. I got the direction. What <laughs> I'm wondering is, do you think, do you hope that people will one day, if they want to make a video on their own, yep. think instead of, oh, I'll make a video in the style of Khan Academy, they'd mm -hmm. be like, oh, I'll make a video in the style of Science Out Loud. Do you see yourselves developing a style that other people might, might one day properly emulate? Uh, I mean, we make science out loud because we think it's good. Well, we, we, <laughs> our, our videos are, I mean, they're, you can look at two different ones not knowing they come from the same program and identify that they're the same series. So there is an aesthetic and there is a style that we do, but we, we ha it's general enough that it like applies to almost any topic a student could come up with. Um, and but so y yes, that, that is the answer to your question. But then also we're experimenting with different shows as you were saying because we want to vary the styles too. So I think it, there is like, yes, yeah, Science Out Loud is going to have its own style, its own identity. You'll be able to tell that an episode is a Science Out Loud episode. And if we want to do a completely different style, uh, then we'll get funding for a totally different series. And if anyone out there wants to fund us, that would be great. <laughs> In case you're wondering, the ingredients for a Science Out Loud recipe are a student host, obviously, on screen, um, something that's unique to MIT or something that a high schooler can't find. A shareable fact, sense of whimsy. What was the fourth one? Um, there is a visual style too. Yeah, I mean, because George directs all of them. Well, so. and you that your doodles and stuff. Yeah, yeah. That too. Uh, yeah, sorry. So going back to the idea of the trusted host, yes. um, you know, both on like the broadcast side of it, like Mr. Rogers, and on like the. Uh, you know, veritasium. Side yeah, like, yeah. So I think a lot of people watch. They watch those videos like they watch the series and they mm -hmm. learn to like love that person. Right. How do you try and capture some of that when you can only ask so much of an individual student? Yeah. And they're not at the same type of relationship. Yeah. So we're actually gonna tinker around with something um, over IAP. So there are a group of students at the Media Lab who've developed an app for Google Hangouts called the Unconference. Um, and this is something that I've l we literally talked about like two weeks ago. So um, if it doesn't pan out, sorry. <laughs> um, but the idea is we do have these awesome student hosts. They don't have the time to necessarily go into classrooms um, or you know, stay on, on their video and respond back to people. But I think it is a cool opportunity for kids to see and interact with these, uh, these students. So um, with the unconference, it's essentially there's like a virtual check-in space and classrooms from all over the country can, can tune in. Um, they pick a video that they all want to watch or they all want to talk about and they go into that um, breakout session and the host um, of that video is there and they're there in their lab or they're there in their skydiving gear. Um, and classrooms from maybe California and Missouri are in this breakout session and all the kids can actually video chat live with the host um, the host can take them around their lab. They can submit questions. It's kind of like a Reddit AMA meets a Google Hangout into this awesome transformer digital <laughs> experience. It's not ideal, obviously, um, but I think that that's what we've come up with right now. Um, that doesn't ask students beyond the, the classroom setting. We have time for one more if you want to. Yeah, Claudia. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I wanted to go back to what you said about going to PBS to, mm -hmm. to jump into GBH and the risk piece. Mm -hmm. Because I've been reading about Sesame Street, I think it's like its 45th anniversary. And at the time when they started Sesame Street, they thought it was incredibly risky, mm -hmm. you know, because it was such a different format. And I think, you know, what you said about um, not, I mean, the, the, the next head of CERN is a woman. Mm -hmm. That, that, you know, that it looks like what we're actually getting is behind the reality yeah. of science. Yeah. 
so that there is there is actually a lot of space out there it seems to me to um, to look for more risk I mean you don't publish everything that you do anyway so there's there's kind of like um, room for I would have thought experimentation if you can find the the right people to work with you on it yeah there's totally room for it and I think at people are just sort of waiting for, you know, it's it's just a matter, a matter of time for an awesome female host to break through. And we don't really have the time to wait, so we're just going to go ahead and make those videos, because we can, because we're at MIT. So. <laughs> um, and Jordan and I will stick around afterwards. You guys are uh, welcome to ask us questions. Thanks again for coming. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. <laughs>